Thank you, Torben, for the very kind introduction. Um, this is the first talk I've ever done wearing a festival wristband, so this is, this is a new one for me. Um, so as Torben said, I'm Becca, and I'm the head of strategy for a programme called Data for Research and Development at NHS England. And for those of you that maybe don't know the NHS so well, um, NHS England essentially leads the NHS um, for England, not across the whole of the UK, and that's where the Data for Research and Development programme sits, although it's funded across government. Um, so we are a three-year programme, we're over halfway through, terrifyingly, um, and we're funded for £175 million over that three-year period. And we have a mission to deliver rapid access to the world's largest linked health data sets, no uh, mean feat, and the reason that we're trying to bring data sets together in a secure way that can be rapidly accessed is threefold, and that's to improve care, support innovation, and sustain the NHS. Um, we recognise that in order to achieve those three aims, we can't focus on a single user type like industry or a single use case like artificial intelligence or clinical trials. We have the unenviable task of trying to meet the needs of a huge cross-section of user types, so including academic, medical research charities, but also the full spectrum of research use cases across epidemiology, public health research, etc. And the way that we are going to satisfy those use cases is by addressing a system that is arguably broken. I think Torben stole my thunder a little bit with some of those statistics, to be honest. Um, but we have issues with data discoverability and cohort finding. It's not easy to understand whether the data required for a particular study exist. And if you know they exist, where to find them or who to approach about them. If you know the answer to who holds data, getting the permissions that you need to access that data can be time consuming and can feel like you're going round in circles. And ultimately, even if you get access to data, sometimes it's not appropriately digitised or the cohorts, population or data modalities are fragmented. So you have to manually bring those data together if you're going to get anything close to a clear picture to answer the question at hand. So ultimately, we really run the risk of research studies not being um, not having the outcome of the clear picture that we want, where we have results that represent our diverse population and ultimately robustly answer the question. So it's the job of me and the team at NHS England working with system leaders um, from across the NHS to try and achieve national scale so that we have the full picture of the population of England, whilst ensuring that there's appropriate expertise from clinical teams supporting interpretation and curation of that information. We also need to bring together different data modalities, so we're not just working on structured electronic health record data, but also digital pathology, genomics and imaging data. And we need to bring our patient and public communities along with us in that journey, bringing together data at national scale and putting together data across different modalities, particularly things like genomics, can be a, a really unfamiliar or uncomfortable um, concept for patients and the public. So we need to deliver, along with the functional data sets that are the world's largest linked together, the confidence of patients and the public that we need to first gain and then maintain. And we need to take all of that complexity required to deliver those um, key outcomes and deliver them as a singular user journey so that researchers can understand whether their data exists, where they exist, whether their study is feasible, have access to the permissions required and ultimately analyse data all in one place with the appropriate tooling required. So we thought pretty long and hard um, before the programme commenced about the best way to deliver all of those outcomes, and we're essentially investing in two key areas with a few underpinning enablers. Area number one is the NHS DigiTrial service, which I'll talk more about in a second. And the second pillar of our investments is the NHS Research Secure Data Environment Network, which is made up of the NHS England Secure Data Environment, the artist formerly known as the NHS Digital TRE, and also 11 secure data environment teams based across England collectively delivering national coverage. 
were underpinned by patient and public involvement and engagement, which I've already mentioned, and actually we will very soon be announcing a supplier who we've procured to deliver mass engagement at a national scale on behalf of NHS England, which will be bolstered by the patient and public involvement and engagement initiatives of the investments that we're making. I work really closely with the Department of Health's data access policy team. Some of you will know them, so they've released a draft data access policy. They're publishing a transition timeline very soon to take us from a default model of data sharing, where data are given out to researchers, to one of data access, where researchers come into secure data environments, a secure analytical layer, to gain the understanding of the data brought together in one place. And we're also working on service design. So that's the kind of end part of the journey once you've got the, the data under the hood fixed. Um, but it's the first part of the journey from the researcher perspective. So it's incredibly important to make sure that that user journey across all of our investments is seamless, transparent, predictable, and fair. So I'm going to start by saying a little bit more about the NHS Digital Service, which some of you will, will know and love. Um, so it was born out of the COVID-19 um, pandemic and essentially provides end-to-end -end support for large-scale, complex or innovative clinical trials underpinned by data that are held by NHS England. So it can conduct feasibility to support researchers to understand whether the population in England is able to suitably power a particular clinical study, whether that's a trial or a cohort study, um, and whether basically we're the right place for them to run their research, and to help them understand what study sites may be the best ones to, to open up. Moving on from that feasibility assessment, DigiTrials can actually use inclusion and exclusion criteria to go out and directly contact potential participants, inviting them to take part in a given study. There's also a communication service, which means that, importantly, participants in studies are able to understand how the study's going as it's going, and actually when a study has finished and what the outcome was, which we probably all are aware is sometimes where communications with participants can fall down. And we think that will be really impactful, not only in terms of supporting patients to stay engaged with the study as it's ongoing, um, but also be more likely to participate in research in the future because they've been able to see the outcome of the, the effort that they've put into participating in the first one. Last but not least, the Digital Service also offers a follow-up service, and again, many of us will be familiar with the fact that following up patients in the long term once a study has closed can be logistically so expensive that it becomes essentially prohibitive. Um, this service will basically mean that organically patients, once they've stopped participating in a study, can be followed up using the information that's routinely generated by the NHS, dramatically reducing the cost and burden on both patients and clinical teams of following people up in the longer term. And we've got some nice examples of NHS DigiTrials in action. So this is an investment area of the programme, um, but we have been focusing on taking the DigiTrials service out of a minimum vi viable product into something that can take on board increasing amounts of studies over time. Um, so because we came in when DigiTrials already existed, um, it's already got some fantastic results to show, um, one of which is its support for the Our Future Health study. I'm sure you're familiar with this um, large-scale cohort study. It's aiming to recruit 5 million people from across the UK and NHS DigiTrials by sending out 16 million invitations to potentially, potentially eligible participants has supported it to reach its a 1 million recruitment target which is in line with where the study expected to be at this point in time. So that direct invitation and literally putting research on the doorsteps of 16 million people has been responsible for over 75% of that 1 million recruits into the Our Future Health study. It also supported the NHS Galeri study, which is an early cancer detection study to recruit 140,000 participants in just 10 months, which we think is the fastest large-scale um, recruitment that the world has ever seen. And whilst it was incredibly successful, the DigiTrial service, by working closely with the study team, has also been able to identify some areas that need further development. And essentially, one of the key learnings from the study was just having national scale and the ability to invite potentially everyone in the country to participate in a study is not enough if you want to get a uh, diverse representation of our population involved in a particular piece of research. But we do need local connectivity to make sure that underserved populations are given equal opportunity to participate and be represented in research. So there's more work to do there. 
Some of you may be aware that NHS DigiTrials um, recently, back in October, um, at the Health Data User Group event, which is the kind of flagship event for the Data for Research and Development programme, um, launched an expression of interest process. And this is the way that we're populating new trial slots as they become available in the service in a way that will deliver rapid patient impact, but also prove out and test the capabilities of the NHS DigiTrials service as we improve its capacity and its capability over time. Also, because it is still operating as a minimum viable product, there is a cap on the number of studies it can support currently. It's not an unlimited resource. So it was really important not only that we appropriately prioritise studies to be onboarded, but also that our community worked with us to give us a demand signal about the future appetite of utilising the NHS Digital Service, because ultimately that helps me and the rest of my team to make sure that we can secure the appropriate resourcing in future to really make that service fly. So there were over 29 expressions of interest for the four um, study slots that were available in NHS DigiTrials, um, and the, the results of the expression of interest process are being communicated to the, the teams involved before Christmas. So just moving on to the NHS Research Secure Data Environment uh, Network, um, we, as I mentioned, fund 11 teams that collectively cover all of England, as well as the NHS England Secure Data Environment. The NHS E Secure Data Environment intrinsically delivers national scale access to highly curated data assets, um, which are really high priority, things like rare disease and cancer data sets. Whereas the um, sub-national secure data environments are able to, to deliver more real-time, more granular, deliberately less curated data sets that can also be multimodal. So there are unique selling points that are available on the one hand in the NHS England SDE, on the other hand in the sub-national SDEs, which mean that they can collectively be a greater than the sum of its parts way of delivering um, that full spectrum of use cases that I mentioned earlier. So ultimately, from a user perspective, you will access national scale scale multimodal data with connectivity not only to local communities for PPIE but also for clinical expertise. And already that network has achieved a lot. Um, it recently published its data pipeline, so you can now see at a glance what data are available right now in the network, including millions of primary care records, but also what data will be available over time in future. We've supported the Powered by NHS Data campaign, which is a public awareness campaign. One in 10 of the population in England have watched one of those campaign videos all the way through, um, which is really important for delivering that level of awareness. We've also got a, a beta collection on HDR UK's Health Data Gateway, which really supports that data discoverability point. And we have over 200 research studies already in the pipeline of the SDE network, with over 50 already live. The NHS England Secure Data Environment is also already supporting research, including really large-scale studies by industry that would not have been possible if we were still using a model of data sharing because of the volume of data required to answer some of these questions, in this case, um, COVID-19 vaccination questions. So these studies are enabled specifically within a secure data environment that would otherwise have not been possible. We also fund a Genomics Driver Project in partnership with Genomics England and the Multimodal Data Team, which is aiming to bring together multimodal data to create the world's largest linked cancer data set. So we're aiming for 17,000 patients to be covered in this cohort, bringing together digital pathology, genomics, imaging, and clinical care data. And that project, under Prabs' leadership in Genomics England, has already achieved 6,000 patients. So already it's the world's largest data set, and we're looking to more or less double that number over time. So whilst we have some successes, the programme is not without challenges. This is where if I was presenting an academic paper, I'd be in the limitations section. Um, and I won't dwell on these, but happy to take questions. The long-term um, income generation and sustainability is a challenge. Um, it's difficult for the secure data environment teams um, who recognise that this is a long-term infrastructure project that takes time to mature, um, but it can also be really challenging to persuade um, government and funders that we need long-term investment to make these, as Ben Goldacre would say, incremental but impatient changes to our health infrastructure. But there is a pretty good prize at the end of the rainbow if we can hold our nerve and let this programme deliver um, over a decent time frame, which is that researchers will be able to go to one place to understand where the data exist, understand the cohorts that are available, gain all of the permissions that are still robust but in one seamless place in a clear way, and 
access data ultimately through a singular analytical interface that delivers that national scale of multimodal data and really get the full picture um, and the answers that they need. So just wanted to say thank you to you for, for bearing with me and listening, but also to the huge community. It really takes a village um, to deliver a program like this. This is an illustration from a recent um, event held with our community of practice. So that's about 80 strong um, people from across the system who lead the secure data environments in our network. And for any of you who have seen me in real life, Verena Stocker, who's the director of IRLS, or Vin Duwaka, who's our national director of transformation, can make a judgment on how accurate that illustration is. That's meant to be as three at the front, um, which gave me a little bit of a giggle when I saw this picture on Friday. Um, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And I think there couldn't be a, a better picture also to illustrate this. So yeah, you know, exactly. clearly communities <laughs> around the world. OK, so we are going um, to a quick session of uh, questions. And a reminder for our friends who are joining online, you have a separate slider, not a quiz slider, but a slider to put your questions in. And I'm going to see around the room first. We have a wandering microphone, as the lovely Kelly has. And if there are any questions uh, in the room, for back up. And I can see one over there. And we're going to film you, so I think now you <laughs> 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 Wonderful. So, um, and if you could introduce yourself, just with like, yes. Anne Delat Mays, uh, consultant with LifeBit, um, specialist in data and sequencing. My question is about patients. Have you made a patient portal to allow them to have access to what's going on and where they are in the journey? The short answer is no, and. <laughs> um, so the. the the R&D program is really specifically targeted at creating access for research use to data in a way that patients and the public feel comfort comfortable with. Um, so a big part of that is being really clear what we're doing and how we're doing it. But another element is doing our work in tandem with other initiatives in NHS England, because we're also greater than the sum of our parts, as well as the secure data environments in the network. So the digital channels team, which lead on the NHS app, absolutely have ambitions not only to allow people to book appointments through the NHS app, but also give greater visibility of clinical data. We're also doing significant patient and public involvement and engagement right now that will not only inform how we sell what we're doing, but actually how we design the secure data environment network. So there still is an opportunity for local communities to tell their secure data environments what they want and need, whether it's over and above a transparency register about how data are being used, and for that to inform SDE design. And yes. Thank you, fantastic talk, uh, Maria, uh, CEO of LifeBit. So um, basically the vision here, or part of the vision, will it be to actually have, create maybe what's going to be the world's first national portal for clinical trial recruitment, where actually can be managed at, the, at an NHS level, where pharma can actually go and, and put requests to actually get patients? So the NHS DigiTrial service is a national service that supports exactly the activity that you mentioned, which is a, a national way of understanding whether a trial can, can take place and actually inviting participants to take part. That is a serviced model, so it's not an eyes-on data access model, it's, it's a service. Um, and the key issue that we're working on at the moment is increasing capacity to deal with the volume of requests because we recognise that that is something that there would be significant interest in. It is also supported by the capacity that is available within the secure data environment network and we're going to build up the clinical trials offer across the secure data environments as well, so we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket from a capacity perspective. And you might also be interested to take a look at the National Institute for Health Research's Be Part of Research platform, which is a research volunteer registry building off of the COVID-19 um, vaccination volunteer registry, which enables direct contact of patients, but in a secure way that they've given explicit permission for. So we have a suite of products that we need to make sure are transparent and clear so that industry know where to go for what type of support. And I believe we have time for one more question. And right behind Maria, yes. Thanks very much. Is it on? I'm Rose Eichenberger from the NIHR Bioresource. Uh, as you may know, we are a large research tissue bank and database of about a quarter of a million participants. We're also setting up a secure data environment to share some data. 
And I was really interested to hear what you're trying to do in cancer imaging, because we also may have a project with IBD samples, and we're kind of finding out how to de-identify them from the trust images. So we are not directly in the NHS, so we have that extra step. Is this something you have been um, looking at as well? So we, we actually have a, a conversation with colleagues of yours lined up, and I do have another slide that I didn't have time for, which essentially shows how the work that we're investing in docks in with the wider ecosystem, because we're, we're not the only game in town, and the, the SDE network will inject significant capacity and capability into the system, but it's not designed to close down or overtake other assets that we know are incredibly valuable to the research community. So I think there's conversations to be had about how we can tangibly draw in NIHR Bioresource, Biobank, Genomics England, our future health in a way that makes sense to researchers of how they interact with one another and how we can support one another. Uh, thank you. But Very happy to chat. Yes, yeah, I wanted to find out about the de-identification of images as well, but we can talk separately, I suppose. That might be enough. I don't know how much time we've got. <laughs> yeah, we will need to get moving um, in terms of the speeches, but there's uh, time for time. coffee and, uh, and snacks afterwards. So um, we have two more speakers, and then there's already the first networking break. So a warm thank you. Uh, thank you, Becca.